people. We have a very special episode with a very special guest today in her pajamas, no less. <laughs> Ellie, we're not supposed to tell anyone that. <laughs> this is the lovely, if you don't know, this is the lovely Wendy McCallum. Hello, Wendy. Hey, Wendy. Hello. Hi, Sam. Hi, Ellie. So Wendy is a super friend of mine. Uh, Wendy and I trained together with this naked mind with the, the first online class and uh, all the way through I looked up to Wendy as a very seasoned coach how the hell do you do all of that <laughs> it's great to have somebody to look up to and uh, uh, was very much in awe of everything that you did during the training and how you supported us all and when you launched your podcast which you can tell us all about too um, it's just it's been wonderful to see how uh, how you've developed your own coaching business and so we wanted to get you here today because you are an expert on burnout so we're going to hear all about that but to begin with it would just be really nice to set the scene if you could tell us a little bit about your story Wendy yeah sure I'd love to thank you for that introduction um obviously I can't do all the things because I'm here in my pajamas so <laughs> Um, in terms, in terms of my story, uh, you know, burnout and alcohol are pretty intertwined for me. And, uh, I am a burnout specialist. I mostly work with women who are, uh, nearing or in burnout, who are using alcohol to cope, which is exactly where I found myself, uh, well, several times, a couple times now in my life, I found myself there. So my story really starts with, you know, where a lot of, this is a pretty common, thread that I see in the stories of the women that I work with, which is that for most of my young adult life, I just did what everyone thought I should do. So I just listened to what everybody else said. I was not paying attention. I didn't even know I had an inner voice. Um, so definitely wasn't hearing it. I was just listening to, you know, the advice and direction of people who cared about me around me, but that ended up taking me through, um, law school. Um, I graduated when I was 25. Um, you know, and law school wasn't a bad experience, but it, and I, I really loved the learning part of it. And I was really good at it, which is kind of also a theme in my life where I would end up doing things that I was really good at, but didn't particularly enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. Law school then led me to I, these ideas during law school that I would be, uh, I would do something around uh, in the criminal justice system. That was really what I was passionate about. And uh, but I did well in law school. And then everybody said, you should go get a corporate job because that's where that's where all the success and money is. And I got pulled into that. I went and did interviews and got a job at a really great firm and ended up working there. Um, I practiced for 12 years. I moved to the other side of the country. I'm from the East coast of Canada. I moved to Calgary, Alberta, which is over on the West side. And I practiced there as a lawyer for about 12 years. Uh, basically from the moment I started, I knew it was the wrong place for me. So I just was, I just had a, a feeling just a knowing that I, didn't listen to that much in the early years, that this was not the right place for me. The, up until that point, my drinking had been pretty typical, you know, just typical sort of high school, college drinking. Um, and uh, what happened when I started practicing law is that it became really apparent very early on, even actually, even in the recruiting process, it became apparent to me that this was part of the profession and I was going to need to learn how to drink in a different way in order to be successful as a lawyer. So I needed to learn, for example, how to drink at lunchtime and then go back to the office and work and be focused and productive and bill, which is something I'd never done before. I'd never been a day drinker. That was not part of my, my drinking history. I was the person who went out with her, her friends a couple of times a week and you know, sometimes had too many beers, but um, I had to learn how to do that. I was going to have to learn about wine and good wine because that was part of the conversation all the time. I was, um, I was going to have to learn how to entertain and recruit others using alcohol as part as part of that process. Um, I was going to have to start incorporating alcohol as part of my celebrations. So celebrations with clients on you know files that had gone well or. Um, celebrations with my fellow lawyers. Um, alcohol was everywhere. And um, so my relationship with alcohol changed. It wasn't so much problematic. It was just weird to me. It felt weird. I came from a middle-class background. My dad was a teacher. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom when I was little. Like alcohol in like a kind of a sophisticated way was just not part of my background. Um, and then what happened is as I as I continued on, my responsibilities got higher. That obviously the hours when you work as a lawyer are very taxing. There was it was a very hard job. I was very physically exhausted and stressed, and sometimes 
you know, working all night and definitely working on the weekends and all of that. Eventually what happened is I met my husband and we went through the process of starting our family. It was very stressful that that contributed to the stress on my plate and that I had, um, I've had a total of five pregnancies and four miscarriages. Those were all very stressful. Um, and we decided to adopt a baby boy, which was wonderful, but also very stressful. So there was all of this stress going on at the same time, right in between my two children. My son was adopted in November of 2003, and my daughter was born in June of 2004. So my kids are seven months apart. I was pregnant when we adopted my son. Right in between those two births, they called me in and made me partner at the firm. Wow. I didn't really have much of a choice at the time. There weren't a lot of other options. It was sort of like take partnership or, you know, go find something somewhere else. So um, I did become a partner. I had these two children very, very close in age. Um, and I was trying to meet the responsibilities of a partnership. I was trying to pay the firm back for giving me these really generous maternity leaves. I felt this pressure to do that. And that is when my drinking took another turn in that for the first time ever, I remember somebody giving us a bottle of wine as a gift uh, with like a basket of cheese or something, maybe a Christmas gift. And I remember looking forward to opening the bottle of wine and being able to have a glass at the end of the day. And that, for whatever reason, that memory is very sort of burned in my brain. And that's the first time I can remember reaching for a glass of alcohol as a way to actually let the valve, like let open up the valve and let some of the steam out on my life. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really when I started drinking as a form of coping and self-medication. So my kids were, you know, quite young at the time, obviously for the first couple of years of their life, there was no room for alcohol for me because I was just so busy. Um, but as they, as they got a little older, it started to become the way that I would reward myself at the end of the day, stop, you know, all of these things we hear Ellie and Sam from our clients all the time, stop the wheels from turning, give us an opportunity to actually rest. I, I always say it was like me putting up a white flag and just letting everybody know in the house, like there will be no more mothering. I'm done. As soon as I opened that bottle of wine, um, eventually I left law. I was burnt out. I didn't know I was burnt out. So clear to me now I was burnt out physically and mentally. Um, my thyroid actually completely burnt out. Ellie, Ellie and I were talking earlier this morning because I had Ellie on my podcast and she was sharing the story of, of how you know, her two children were on the floor and she was sitting, I think, in a chair thinking to herself, they deserve better than this. I remember that same feeling, Ellie, of sitting in a chair. Um, my, my house that we lived in when my kids were little was like a split level. So there were just like five steps between the levels. There were all these like tiny little levels. And I was two levels down for my kids and I could hear someone crying. And I was sitting in a chair and I remember thinking to myself, I have to go get that person. I need to go help that person. And then this other part of my, my, I don't know, it was my brain or no, it was probably just my completely depleted thyroid hormones <laughs> saying like, but you can't. And I remember sitting there, this, this back and forth, like, I have to go help this baby. You can't get up. I have to go help this baby. You can't get up. I mean, I was in such severe burnout at that point that my thyroid was completely gone. I found that out later and thank goodness um, somebody noticed that. And I was able to get what I needed to, to come back from that. We ended up leaving Calgary. We, I, I made the decision to leave law. It was, uh, it was a hard decision in many ways, but also the easiest decision of my life and that I'd never felt fulfilled. It was not the right career for me. I was, it was not, I was not feeling resonant. I, I just had this feeling there was something else I was supposed to be doing. I didn't know what it was. Um, and also I was burnt out. So I felt like I, I had no choice. So we, we left um, Calgary and moved back to Halifax. And then here's where the drinking took another step because my kids were now four years old and for one full year I was home with them which I'd never I'd never had that luxury before I'd always been working but I had this one year where my children were still able to be with me at home and didn't have to start school yet so I spent that year with them and I went to, I did everything I was just I was so committed to just doing all the things I'd never done with my kids before I was like taking them to the swimming pool every day and to the you know, to the park and the zoo. And I was going to mummy groups and I was, you know, going to the library puppet shows and doing all of these things. What, what was happening at exactly the same time that I can now see in hindsight is that mummy wine culture was just taking off. So this was in 2008-ish and it was just starting to get its, you know, feet under it. And so I was being offered alcohol everywhere. 
Like it was just everywhere. It was everywhere I went. It was at, you know, it was at the, it was at the mummy play groups. It was at um, book club. It was, it was, it was everywhere. Um, and also I realize now in hindsight, as much as I love spending that time with my children and I am so grateful for it and see it as such a luxury and a gift, I have the privilege of being able to do that. I know many mothers don't. Um, I was bored out of my mind. I had gone from being like hyper stimulated for 12 years. My brain never shut off to hanging out with two four-year-olds who could barely verbalize, right? So it, everything shifted for me there. And I didn't recognize that that was a need that was not getting filled. Um, and I think that is really now in hindsight, what fueled the increase of my drinking over the next 15 years, 10 years after that. So that just continued. I just, you know, as it does, I mean, it was very, it was very quiet and, and sort of unassuming in its, its sort of, um, malignancy alcohol, mm. but over time it just realized I was just drinking more and more and more. I just needed more. And that's, I see now is clearly the problem with the substance is an addictive substance and the way our bodies work with tolerance. But, you know, we got, to, I got to the point where I was about 45 years old and I realized I was wanting to drink every single day. Um, it was a real struggle for me to not drink. Um, I was a gray area drinker in that I was not drinking, you know, copious amounts of alcohol every night. It wasn't majorly impacting my quality of life. Although now I would say it actually was, but at the time it didn't feel like it was, I was doing all the things I was at that time running a coaching business that was successful, but still part-time. And I wasn't really working in the niche that I wanted to be working in. So my coaching wasn't as fulfilling as I now realize it, it should have been. Um, and I, and, and honestly, as you know, Ellie, my dad got sick, uh, and, I just had this moment of reckoning where I was just so sick and tired of trying to moderate my own drinking. I had been trying to moderate it for probably three or four years at that point, um, making rules for myself, breaking them, um, just constantly breaking them, which meant constantly beating myself up for being a failure, um, using alcohol for every single thing now. So whenever anything went wrong or went right, alcohol was the first thing, yeah. you know, a glass of wine, I'll have a glass of wine. I'm bored, I'll have a glass of wine. I'm, I'm tired, I'll have a glass of wine. I'm angry, I'll have a glass of wine. Mm. Um, I'm sad, I'll have a glass of wine. And of course, when my dad got sick, I got very sad and I started using alcohol as a way to kind of unwind and in my mind anyway, unwind and go to sleep at night after I came home from the hospital. And uh, I just, again, I had this moment of reckoning. I was sitting in a chair. It was right before uh, Christmas of 2000 and in 2017. And I was drinking by myself in a chair. I mean, my family was somewhere in the house, but I was drinking this glass of red wine. I'd probably already had a couple. And I thought to myself, I don't even fucking like this anymore. Like, I don't even think I like this anymore. This is not, why am I doing this? I don't even like this anymore. I'm so sick and tired of all of this. I kept drinking um, over Christmas, um, but I think it was less just because I had realized I really didn't even like it anymore. Um, but then I think I probably had some kind of a bender because I was on a self-imposed wine fast like middle of January. So I probably had had a night where I drank too much before that. I four it was four days alcohol free and I had to drive to get uh, we have a national health system here like you guys do in the UK and it's hard to get things done and sometimes you have to drive a long way but it's free so it's great and I had an MRI scheduled for my neck and I had to drive for four hours to get the MRI and I I was driving by myself and it was a boring drive so for the first time in my life I downloaded an audiobook to listen to and I do not know still what took me to this naked mind but I just found it I still feel like it was a universe intervening. Um, I downloaded that audiobook. I'd never listened to one thing about quitting drinking or changing my relationship with alcohol before. I hadn't listened to a podcast, nothing. But the title intrigued me. I thought, ooh, control alcohol? Okay, <laughs> I'm in for that. And I downloaded it and I listened to it all the way there. And I got my MRI. I remember lying in the MRI tube thinking about the book and what I'd been learning. And I listened to it all the way home. And when I got home, I still had about a half an hour left. So I sat in the driveway. I'd been gone for like 10 hours at this point. <laughs> I sat in my driveway and finished listening to it. And it changed, it, it changed everything for me. It was not spontaneous sobriety. I don't, I want to be really clear about that. I'm not entirely sure I believe in that. I think there's lots of work that has to be done in the beginning, but what it was, was this incredible moment of awareness for me, where I realized that this was not my fault that I was not alone, 
and there, there, that there was actually a possibility that my life might be better without alcohol. And I had never contemplated that before that moment. Up until that point, it had been all about how can I keep this thing in my life? Because there's no way I can live without it. Um, so that was a real game changer for me. That led me to a 30 day alcohol experiment at the time. There wasn't a coach led one. So I did the self-guided one online. Um, and then as I like to say, I never had any intention of never drinking again. I'm four and a half years out now. It wasn't, it was not my goal. Um, I really did though, want to make alcohol small and irrelevant. I wanted it to no longer be running the show. And basically what I did is I would revisit my decision every 30 days or so. And I would ask myself, are you ready to risk everything that you've gained? Are you like, are you prepared to potentially not feel this inner peace that you haven't felt for 20 years? Are you prepared to give that up yet? And the answer was always no, not yet. And so, as I like to say, I not yet had myself to 365 days. And by the time I got there, I was just, I just could not see why I would drink anymore. So it was just such an easy decision. And I still say never say never, but uh, alcohol is so small and irrelevant for me now that I just, I barely think about it, except for the fact that I do this for a living and talk about it all day long. But <laughs> I don't think about my own relationship with alcohol anymore. It, it, it is really a non-factor for me. And the freedom and peace that comes with that is just, is just incredible. And of course, my second burnout, just to go back to talk about when my dad was sick, my second burnout kind of happened around that time. And um, I, when I quit drinking, it was also timed with the fact that we had just gotten the news that my dad was only gonna live for a year. Um, and I knew that I had two choices. I could keep going the way I was going, feeling miserable and exhausted and beating myself up um, and not being present for my life, or I could figure out how to get present. And it was so clear to me that there were a couple of things that needed to happen when I needed to quit drinking I need, or get just make it small and irrelevant. Like I needed it to stop being the thing I was thinking about all the time, because how could I possibly be there with my dad and my mom and my sister? And for my kids through this really kind of horrible last year of my dad's life, if I was thinking about like when I could get to a glass of wine, yeah. you know, which is what would have been happening. Um, and also I needed to learn how to be with myself. And this took a lot longer. Um, I'm still working on this, although I'm much better at it. Um, but I needed to learn how to not be afraid to just sit with myself which was the main reason why I was drinking the way I was drinking. Um, actually, just the other day, I had this epiphany. I went out for a walk um, and I didn't have my headphones on. And I went for like an hour, an hour and a half. And uh, it was a beautiful walk. And I was walking back and I was thinking to myself, oh, this is, this is so interesting. You've, you don't have your headphones. You didn't think about putting your headphones in. You didn't think about what podcast you were going to download before you went out. You didn't think about what self-help book you were going to listen to. You just went out for a walk. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I'm finally good with my own thoughts and not afraid of what I'm going to tell myself. Mm -hmm. And that was such a big moment for me because I think that's what I've been chasing since I quit drinking and I'm finally there. So there is no such thing as spontaneous, in my mind, spontaneous sobriety. And it, I don't even like the word sobriety, I use freedom. It, it takes a while to get there. It's a slow, it's a slow boil to get yourself from, you know, in my experience anyway, to get yourself from fixation to, to real liberation. But there's so much that comes along with that liberation. It's not just liberation from alcohol. It's for me, it was like liberation from this whole self-help industry and this idea that I needed to be constantly working on myself and, and that I needed someone else to tell me what I needed. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very long explanation of my story, but that's kind of where I got to where I am. It's wonderful, Wendy. Awesome. I've, I, I've, I know a lot about you, but it's just it's wonderful to, to hear your story in like in, in a nutshell. And there was something that really stood out at the very beginning that I think we we can all you know be, be victim to this. This I, I call it like the the volume on everybody else's voice is toned right up, and we can hear all of that and the ambient noise and and our inner voice, our inner knowing. It's like it's turned down so far, and we just we we can't hear it. And so that that journey back to it's like we we don't want to totally tune out everybody in our own lives, but we need to we need to somehow turn that down so that we've got the capacity to hear ourselves and, and turn that inner voice up yeah 
because that that's what we really need to be guided by and it doesn't mean that we're not going to have challenge in our lives but that we we can be guided in a very um, a very natural and authentic way that that feels right because when we listen to others and I did exactly the same thing even I remember um, considering what I was going to study at university and I was really excited because I wanted to I wanted to study English and I was really into um, creative pursuits and my auntie said something to me like well you're not going to earn any money doing that are you so you, you know you, you need to get picked up on the milk round you need to be in economics or you know is it like that here's the things that you have to be doing and I was constantly told you know how things were and what I should feel and think and so I, I, I stopped listening to myself and that's the one thing like when I look at my kids mm. I they, they've got that already and I want them to hang on to it like I don't want them to start drowning their own voice out um, with um, with the voice of others because then as you say it becomes very difficult to sit with yourself and I think mm. that's why we need all of those other inputs I think it's fascinating that you you went out on your on your long walk without earphones how did it feel when you were on your walk? Well, it felt great. I mean, I, to be honest, I've been doing it a lot. I just, I wasn't really, I just hadn't had that moment of awareness around the fact that I was no longer thinking about whether I was going to listen to something. And, you know, I always listen to something for, for years I listened to. And I think this is important in the early days of becoming alcohol free. I do think it is important to stay connected and to use all of the tools that I always say, throw the book at it in the early days. It's not, it's not a, it's not a part-time thing. Um, if you're really serious about it. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time listening to things. So I think I, I had, you know, it phased out of it slowly over time. I just hadn't noticed it. And um, one of the, my good friends who I, ha I have on my podcast all the time, Sarah Bailey, uh, she's a naturopathic doctor. She and I had been talking about this idea of maybe we're done with the fucking self-help. Like maybe, can I swear on this podcast? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just a encouraged. swearing podcast. Yes, okay, so- yeah, I think we just, we were like, we're done with it. We have, you know, we're both uh, over 50. I'm 50 now. I've been through menopause. I have this very, very solid feeling of knowing who I am that I did not have. And I think leaving alcohol behind is part of that. And I, and we were just talking about how like, maybe we're done with it because we actually don't need it anymore. And isn't that the goal, like to get to a place where you recognize you don't, and it's not to say that I don't have personal growth uh, left in me, I absolutely do. I believe in continual personal growth, but right now I'm choosing to focus on listening to my own voice and actually figuring out what those things are for myself and then incorporating those things and really getting clear on what my needs are, what I need more of and what I need less of in my life. And I love what you said about the creativity, Ellie, because I had exactly the same experience. My, I went, I did an English degree as my undergrad, which everyone was okay with. My dad was an English teacher. I was very good at English and writing. And so um, everyone thought that that was a decent like first degree, but then of course I would go do something else after that. Right. And then when I did well in my English undergrad, then the assumption was I would go to law school because what else would you do with really great marks in an English degree? Of course, you're going to go to law school, but I really wanted to, to do, I had two things that I really wanted. I was considering at the time one, which I knew was never going to fly was to go, we have a very good art college here. So it was to go to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design um, because I loved, I loved everything, everything mm -hmm. creative. Um, and the other one was to go to a university called Ryerson in Toronto and do journalism. Yeah. And I did neither one of those things. And it's interesting to me that both of, those, both of those things involved like a creative pursuit. And in particular for me, the writing piece is interesting because I think you may know this, Ellie, but uh, maybe not. Um, you know, in the last year or so, part of, me uh, sort of coming into my own, I call it, or kind of coming back home, I think is a better way to, to talk about my uh, experience and the experience so many women have in midlife with burnout and hormonal fluctuations and life stage changes and all of that is this feeling of coming back home. Such a big piece of that for me was recognizing that the real need that had not, that had gone unsatisfied for like 25 years was creativity for me and it was writing which is what led me to um this wonderful workshop that i took with Anne Dowsett johnston who's the author of drink which is an amazing memoir if you haven't read it it's a best-selling memoir she has since become my private writing coach and i am in continued i've been in a workshop group with a group of new writers since september oh. um and i'm writing and i'm writing like 
pretty prolifically and I absolutely love it. What's going to happen with it? I don't know, but I am writing and it's really filling this, this mm. need for me, this create that creative piece. So, you know, I love the way you said that about turning down the volume because I really, I, and or turning up the volume, I guess, on other people's uh, thoughts uh, and words and advice and all of that, because and I don't like, I'm not looking back at this with great regret. I think it all worked the way, out the way it was supposed to work out. And I don't regret my career as a lawyer. There were many parts of it that were actually really wonderful. And I learned an awful lot of really amazing skills and, and kind of life strategies and tools that I use now as a coach. Um, I wouldn't be coaching around burnout if I hadn't had that burnout, you know, that yeah, sure. burnout and corporate experience. So, um, but I, I do think it's important to look back and ask yourself what was actually working well for me then and what wasn't working well. And, and definitely one of the things that I was not tuned into for most of my life was what I actually wanted and needed. Um, so that's been a big change. The, um, the hindsight things really, it feels to me, this is the journey that I went on. And I think you're pointing in the same direction, Wendy, is for a while, we're like a map collector and that's really fun. And we're collecting all these maps, all these self-help books and oh, I can do it this way and that way. But then, then the inner GPS turns on and we're like, yeah. oh, actually <laughs> maybe the map collection is not so useful anymore. And don't get me wrong. Like it's still fun to yeah. talk about that stuff and explore it, but actually it's a, uh, yeah, it's a path. Like, like you said about coming home, because once you're home, you don't need the map anymore. Mm. And then you can kind of be guided by that feeling. And, um, yeah, it's funny because me and Ellie often, um, I often talk about the experience I have where an insight has happened, but the story in my head hasn't caught up. And then I'll have this experience where actually I had one the other day. I left at like a salsa dancing event and I literally said to my partner, Robin, oh, that's so weird. It didn't occur to me for 90 minutes to get socially anxious. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, It just didn't make sense. Yeah. And I was like, that's so mad. Like not once across the whole mm -hmm. time did any of that. And that's like, a, who knows what's been going on. And recalibrating behind the scenes but it's because of like the reconnecting yeah. with with who we are and then it's like you know we've heard this thing a lot like the map's not the territory right so as soon as you realize that you can throw the maps out and and it's yeah. great it's really freeing to do that yeah. I love that so much um that's something I talk to clients about all the time that idea that we have this assumption that we can't socially climatized without alcohol and so we go into these events and just get you know it's it's become our crutch in terms of the thing that speeds us up and gets us there faster but one of the best things I ever learned about that I think it was from Annie Grace I can't remember who said this but you know your body will naturally do that for you if you just give it time yeah. and so experimenting with that is really cool I love that I would say that's happened to me too I'm not sure I've had the insight you've had but I never, I don't go into events anymore with any anxiety around like how it's going to go, whether I'm going to stand out, whether it's going to be awkward. And, and actually, Sam, the thing that's been most amazing for me is the fact that I'm no longer um, feeling the need to escape from being with myself, the social anxiety of being with myself, which for sure. so long, like just kept me, kept me in drinking um, and the confidence. It's, it's the same thing, just on a, a different scale, I guess, but it's just over time happens if you just keep going so hopefully th this is a message of hope for people listening I mean it's not in, I'm in no way dissing the self-help industry I relied on it heavily and I still will pick up like you can see on the bookshelf behind me <laughs> there's you know stacks and stacks of books that I've read and I will keep reading but I I just have a different filter perspective through which I see it now which is I get to decide whether to take or leave this this yes. may or may not be helpful or necessary for me let me read this and take what I need from it and leave the rest. Yeah, and and all those, you know, however we come to it, all the books are kind of our own personal uh, way of reverse engineering the insights that we've had. So it's, you know, the power of now is like, here's how to be in the present moment. You know, another book might be like, here's how to find creativity, but actually that kind of like insight, that creative, like that's in all of us. Mm -hmm. And the moment we start tuning into that, like we might, it might be great to, to keep reading the books and all the rest of it and I feel exactly the same as you like but I don't feel like this comp I used to have like a compulsion to read them yes. like I had the same thing and, and often I really often go for a walk without my headphones mm -hmm. um like if I'd have forgotten them before or get on the bus I can, can remember going to school as a teacher and sometimes I'd forget my headphones and I'd have this moment of like oh god what am I gonna do gonna have to like sit on the bus and like be on my own for like, <laughs> have a look, like what yeah it's lovely to just be it's lovely mm -hmm. to just be it's such a beautiful yeah thing. Mm -hmm. I use that actually that I'm glad you said that because we go back to the topic of burnout. I think one of the reasons why 
you know, one of the problems that women face oftentimes, and this really does often present for women in their late thirties, early forties into, into their kind of up till the age of 50, there's often this intersection between that stage of life, that midlife stage and burnout. And then of course, what's going on with, for women hormonally. But I think one of the reasons why we, you know, one of the things that we experience in that period is this, and I hear this articulated in different ways all the time from women. It's this idea of like, I'm not sure what to do if I'm not doing right. So the doing becomes the focus. And of course we have two as humans, we have two, there are two states we can be in. We can be doing, or we can be being. And I think we get very, very good at doing as women, especially, and I'm not, you know, this is a generalization, but you know, working the women that I work with largely highly successful, uh, very high achieving women who have accomplished all kinds of things professionally and are also parents. That's, that's usually who I'm working with. And, um, and that is, the category I would put myself in as well. And I got incredibly good at the doing. In fact, productivity was my currency. It was the way I valued myself. It was how I thought other people valued me. And so I got to this point where I did not know how to not do. And the idea of just being was terrifying for me. And I think, again, that's, that's why I had that whole social anxiety with being with, with myself thing, because if I was just sitting there by myself, well, then what was I, if I wasn't doing anything, I guess I had to be, and I didn't know how to be, you know? Um, and I think that's really where I've gotten to now is that I'm very comfortable with the being side of things. And I've also recognized through the work that I've done on myself and also the work that I do with other women, that the value that we have as women is really completely disconnected from what we do. Um, and the doing it's all of the doing is what's taking us down. It's also what's leading us to drink. It's also the, one of the biggest reasons why we drink the way that we drink. Mm -hmm. There's, um, there's a real ease with that transition to being, and it can mm -hmm. feel incredibly uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but once we start operating in that space more, like it, it feels so good. Yeah. And you, you realize that all, all of that efforting around whatever the, the efforting, like it, it, it just falls away. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just also at this point, I'm just going to interject with the, I'm really sorry if you can hear my husband mowing. He always chooses to mow the fucking lawn on a Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you not see the light on outside? <laughs> Good grief. Here he comes. Um, it's about to get loud again. <laughs> He's going right past the window. So you've um, got a directional microphone. It's fine. We can't hear <laughs> Um, I was going to ask Wendy, could, mm. when you were talking about burnout, you said, you said something like that you, you didn't realize that that's where you were at. You didn't realize that you were in burnout. Can you just describe what burnout is and what it sure. feels like so that people yeah. can understand, yes. um, you know, if they're thinking they might be feeling a certain kind of way is, is that what they're feeling? Sure. So it's a great question. Um, burnout is not a diagnosis per se. So you won't find it in a diagnostic manual. It's sometimes very difficult to get someone to, to tell you that you're in burnout. Um, but you should absolutely go and talk to somebody about that. If you are, if you are experiencing a collection of these common signs of burnout. So there are some very common signs. Um, the first thing that very often presents in burnout is is exhaustion, just complete exhaustion. So physical and mental exhaustion, I was definitely there. Um, the next little piece that we see in burnout is, is there are different ways to articulate it. Um, I call it like a, a desensitization or a depersonalization. It's like just where you sort of, you step back from your life. You're almost like, you're almost feeling like a distance between you and your life and your, you see things differently and things are irritating you and people are irritating you in a way that they didn't before. So for, for some of my clients, it's this, this idea that like, they'll say, Wendy, I don't understand. My, my cup was always half full. I was always a really positive person. Mm -hmm. And at some point things shifted and now I feel myself negative and kind of cynical. And it's like my glass is half empty all the time. That's a really common way of, 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 say, of identifying it, but it also shows up as this, this, this distancing and it's hard to describe, but just like, it's like you're watching your life 
um, instead yeah. of being in it. Um, and then there's so many other some signs and symptoms, but I'll go through a few, a few other ones. Um, one of the most common things we see is you just stop taking care of yourself. So you're so overwhelmed with your responsibilities, the stress and everything, all of the things that you have to do every day, you're so caught up in the doing um, that you're not taking care of yourself anymore. So we look at, you know, the main pillars of wellness, as I would describe them, your good sleep, food, um, joyful movement and mental health and stress management practices, those have kind of fallen off because of course, anybody knows who's busy. The first thing that gets canceled in your calendar is anything that has to do with taking care of yourself, right? So those things go by the wayside. And then of course, as a result of that, because we're human, we are going to start leaning into any quick fixes that we have available to ourselves that might actually help us get there mm -hmm. um, in a shorter amount of time. And for many of the women that I work with, that includes alcohol, um, but it might also be food, online shopping, social media, um, gambling. There are lots of different tools that we use now um, as quick escapes. So uh, increased reliance on unhealthy coping mechanisms is almost always there as well. Decreased work productivity, um, so just an inability to focus and be productive is almost always there in burnout. And then, um, you know, uh, I think the thing I hear the most is this, and this is the, the descriptor for this sign or symptom of burnout is a decreased satisfaction with life. And here's how that shows up for me. It's this kind of a statement from a client. I don't get it. I've done all of the things. I have everything I thought I ever wanted and it still feels like something's missing. I'm just not happy. And I feel guilty saying that. Mm. And that's exactly where I was when I, after I got out of law and I came home and I was working as a coach, it's like, why am I not feeling good? I've done all the things. I even gave up the bloody career that I thought drove me to this, which by the way, it didn't. It wasn't the legal career that drove me to burnout. It was my inability to actually prioritize myself ever um, and to speak up for myself and take what I needed that, that led me to that burnout. But it happened again when my dad got sick and died um, because of all of the physical and emotional stress involved in that whole process. Thank God I wasn't drinking during that, but I burnt out again after that because it was, it was very intense. Um, and so I found myself in this place again, like where I was kind of trying to figure out what the heck, how did I get here? But it was this feeling of like, I've done all the things. Like I've got the family I worked so hard for. I've got this career that I love. I've got a really solid relationship in place. You know, I'm financially stable. Like, why am I not feeling better about all of this? Why am I not happy? And then feeling a guilt for not having that. So that's very, very often there as well. And then unfortunately in burnout, at the end stages of burnout, there's very often a physical consequence that happens. So we often see it start to play out as an illness, physical illness in the body. It might be high blood pressure, high blood sugar, um, high blood triglycerides. These things are all connected to chronically elevated levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone um, that is involved in the stress response. And, you know, it, as Ellie and I have talked about before, you're, we're absolutely built for stress. So stress isn't the, you know, stress in, is in itself isn't the problem. The problem is chronically unmitigated stress. So that stress levels that are allowed to go up when your cortisol is allowed to rise, and then it just goes unchecked for long periods of time. And very often for women um, and men, we can, we adapt to that. So there's this period of adaptation where our body is like, can, oh, okay, this is the new normal. I, I can do this. And then we do it, we continue doing for a very, very long period of time. And this is when women will come in and see me and be like, it's okay, I have a really good capacity for stress. I'm like, hold on now. <laughs> you are just a mere mortal, as far as I'm aware. You have no greater capacity for stress than anybody else does. You're just in, a, in an adaptation place right now where your body has figured out how to do this. The other shoe will drop. This is, it, this cannot be a permanent place and you will, you will come back, back down from that. And that, that's really, you know, at the end, at the end of the day, that often shows up, unfortunately, as a physical, as a physical symptom for me, it was the, you know, in that first burnout, it was literally the burning out of my thyroid. My thyroid went into overdrive and, and just burnt itself out completely. Um, because my body was trying so hard to keep up with all of the doing that was happening at that point, because I had two babies seven months apart. And I was also trying to stay connected to this partnership I had at the law firm. So, so that's burnout. I do want to say one more thing, which is burnout is often defined as an occupational phenomenon, but it's very important to understand that it doesn't just arise from the workplace. So the first thing I want to say is there's caregiver burnout is real and it's important that we address it. 
And oftentimes the women that I work with, I see those two things presenting together. So it's occupational burnout and it's also mm-hmm. stress from caregiving. And especially in the last couple of years with the pandemic, yeah. there's been an increased uh, responsibility on many parents around caregiving and many adults, period, not just care for parenting children, but also parenting their parents and their elderly, their elderly relatives. So um, it's important to recognize that that's real stress and that caregiver burnout can also exist. And again, oftentimes the two things exist together. And I also want to say one more thing about the occupational or job side of burnout. One of the misconceptions that a lot of people have is that you can only burn out if you don't like your job. And that's not true. You can be doing something that you absolutely love and also burn yourself out because stress is stress. Mm. You know, good stress, bad stress. I'm putting these in air quotes because there's really no such thing, but good stress, bad stress, they all lead to exactly the same physiological response in your body. They all lead to elevated to cortisol. Um, And so it's important to be mindful of that. It doesn't matter how much you love what you're doing. If you are doing it without any mitigation of the stress that you're under, you're going to get to that place eventually. So I hope that helps to answer that question around what is burnout. It's it's a complicated thing. And obviously a lot of those signs and symptoms can also be signs and symptoms of other things. So it is important to go see a doctor if you're feeling this way. And you don't have need to have all of those in order to be burnt out or nearing burnout. I always say, if you're listening to me talk about this and you're thinking, oh, I have that. And I think I have that. I don't have that, but I have that. This should be enough for you to have a look at this and actually start asking yourself, could this be better? And what could I be doing to help improve these things? I mean, if you've got three or four things on that list, then you're probably not feeling amazing. So, you know, start taking a look into this, start looking at your stress management practices that you have in place, start looking at the, the stories that you're telling yourself about your value and whether, you know, you need to be doing all the time. Um, so, so common that women will say what I used to say to myself, which is, if I stop, I'll never start again. I can't stop. I need to keep going. This feeling of like being very, very restless. If there was nothing actually on my to-do list, I used to walk around, I'd open and close cupboard doors. I'd be looking for things to do. Like I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't sit still. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And I was worried that if I stopped, I would stop forever. Yeah. Challenge that challenge that because guess what? The sky will not fall. Say no to something, start mm-hmm. small, say no to something small. Notice what happens after that. Does the person actually even care? Do they find someone else to do it? Um, Are there long-term recriminations here? Do they somehow see you as a less valuable human because you said no? You have to challenge these things and experiment with them. So everything we talk about in this naked mind around curiosity and self-compassion and experimentation, I use all of those same approaches when we're talking about burnout and stress levels and all the doing. Um, We have to build our own confidence in the fact that the sky won't fall if we do less. And that it will actually feel good. And it takes a while for it to feel good, but it will actually feel good to do less. And unless you do less, how are you ever going to incorporate more stress mitigation in your life? You know, these tools that, you know, we don't have time to talk about on this podcast, but there's so many things that you can do to help manage that cortisol level. And how are you ever going to find time to incorporate those things if you never slow down? So the slowing down is the first step. The second step is, um, is kind of something we haven't talked about, which is, looking at your life and asking yourself, is there any stress here that doesn't need to be here? You know, there's always going to be stress that you can't manage and that's okay. You're built for stress. There, there's been, there are going to be people who are ill and dying. There are going to be, there's going to be work stress. There might be relationship stress. These are all things, parenting stress. We can't do much about those most of the time, but there are always all of these, this multitude of things that are causing our, causing our cortisol to rise, like, you know, 17 times a day that we actually could choose to manage and respond to differently. And so that's kind of the second step. And then the last step in burnout prevention and recovery is is incorporating, starting to practice and incorporate these foundational um, strategies. Um, I call them kind of the building blocks here for resilience. Um, And those are any practices that help you to regulate your nervous system and that give you a moment of being. Um, you know, anything, and I would say like, if you're trying to figure out what these are, ask yourself if you could possibly do it, if you were being chased by a saber tooth tiger. And if the answer is no, <laughs> I would never do that. If I was being chased by a saber tooth tiger, it's probably exactly the thing you need to signal to your body that you're safe. 
So I would never sit down and read a book if I was being chased by a saber toothed tiger. I would never put on my favorite dance music and have a little dance party if I was being chased by a saber toothed tiger. I wouldn't call a friend and ask them if they wanted to meet me for coffee if I was being chased by a saber toothed tiger. I wouldn't go for a leisurely walk in the woods. I would be running my ass off if I was being chased by a saber toothed tiger. So, you know, there all of those types of practices, anything that serves to signal to your brain that you're safe is something that's going to help pull you out of fight or flight. And, and those are all the types of things that you want to be peppering your day with and they, they really can take like three minutes they're not these are not you know you don't need to meditate for an hour it's great if you do that you love it great but that's not necessary um you want to be trying to close the cycle all day long that stress cycle just pull yourself out of that high cortisol place right so this is how we mitigate the cortisol i said burnout is unmitigated cortisol this is how we mitigate it it's by getting a set of practices and practices in place. And I know Ellie that you, you do this well because you and I just, you were just on my podcast and we just talked about this, but this idea of um, incorporating in your day, these moments of mindfulness where you actually allow yourself a chance to come down. And really what we're talking about is being, you know, coming back to the present moment and being. Um, so that's burnout 101 in 10 minutes. You did um, well. Awesome. <laughs> You did well. I think uh, you made me really reflect on the one experience I've had where I really had to throw, I threw in the towels, I call it, for like six months. I was like, because, so when the pandemic came and I was sort of building a business and I was like, huh, I'm now not in school teaching. I was like, there's a deadline. So I made up a load of stuff in my head that felt very real. Like it has to be done by this time. If I'm going to miss the boat, et cetera, et cetera. And I got one thing that I found, I think the biggest insight for me was I was just confused about who I am. Like I, I thought I was Sam, the personality in my head who had to prove himself with certificates and, and all this stuff out there. And that fuel to drive that it never ends. Cause it's, you know, with everything we find, there's something else we need to do. There's some, another way we need to prove ourselves. But the moment we, in the being, which is the only constant, you know, when we're really home to the truth of who we are, I am, before I am this, I am that. I am plus thing that's inconsistent and always shifting. Once we sit in the permanency of just awareness where nothing can be taken away from us, nothing can be added to it. It's complete. It's not, it's like not in form in the way that we think about it. It's a feeling. Once we realize, Oh shit, is that who I am? Like I actually don't have anything to prove when, once we really see that, that creative flow you're talking about suddenly it's like, Oh, and I can still do all this stuff. But it's, it's full of like, uh, you know, I'm just not the fuels. I'm not being driven by the same stuff. You know, it's OK. And the more space I put into my diary, as much as it's, I find it hard, like today's a mad day, for example. But when I put time in my diary to be mm -hmm. um, or if I just take that inner space, more stuff starts happening with more creative flow. And um, it was mean really important. Me and Ellie kind of spoke about this at the beginning that we wanted to build what we're doing here with that energy. We didn't want to get lost in the kind of, cause we've both been lost in it before. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's a really wonderful space to be in. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you really got me thinking about that. I love everything you said and yeah. 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 It's, it's where the, it's honestly, it's where all the magic happens. And for so long, I thought the magic happened in like really hard work. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's not that I'm against hard work and I still work hard, but I hear what you're saying. And I always try to explain it to people as like, you can't be and do at the same time. And you need a certain amount of doing in your life in order to get anything done, right? But you also need some being. And if you're doing all the time, then you're never being. And if you're being all the time, then you're never doing. And it's really about finding the balance between the being and the doing. If you imagine like a seesaw, you know, teeter-totter type thing at the playground where it's like, if all you're doing is being, then there's no doing. And if all you're, you know, like you want to try to find that balance between those two things. And at different times in your life, you're going to necessarily have to do more. This is life. This is how real life works. This isn't about finding this balance and then keeping it for forever this like sweet spot that's not how life works it is a constant I always say think of balance as a verb instead of as a noun because it's less something that you find and keep and more something that you need to be constantly working at and that sounds exhausting but it's more just a mindfulness piece like am I how am I feeling like checking in with yourself? How am I feeling today? Has there been too much doing today? Do I need a little more being right? And how can I make that happen for myself? You are in charge of your own life. 
you get to decide what it looks like. If it feels horrendously busy, you can change that. And I know for a lot of people listening to this podcast, they're thinking, no, I can't. Trust me, you can. Take it from the world's busiest person. <laughs> you can change that. The first step is the awareness, which as we were just talking about is often uncomfortable. The second step is stepping into personal responsibility. This is nobody else's life, but your own. All of these things that you're doing um, probably benefit somebody. <laughs> this is the place to experiment with how do I start letting some of these things go? And, and it really is an experiment and you can take your time with it. It doesn't need to happen overnight, but it feels so good to step back into the driver's seat of your own life. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you can do this at any time. And I always say, you get to put the suitcase down, the one that's heavy, the one that feels awful, you get to lay it down and walk away from that. So if you've got something heavy, whether it's alcohol or it's stress, or it's trying to look after, you know, looking after way too many people or running a business that feels like it's gotten out of control, like you get to lay that down. I mean, you're going to want to do some strategizing around how you do it. Don't just drop it and walk away, <laughs> but you get to make a plan for laying that down and you get to leave it behind if it's not serving you. Yeah, I uh, I think it's it's about trust for me. Like if you trust in your personality to sort things out for you, like you, you end up in hot water. This is my experience. But the moment you trust in the being, the creative being that you are, like it doesn't mean that it might make perfect sense to you to have a week where you work really hard because you've got a lot of stuff to get done. But it's it's not coming from the same place. It's right. coming. It makes sense to you from a different space. It's not... Yeah oh, I need to do this to complete myself. It's, I need to do this because I want to build a business that's going to kick ass or I need to, oh, or I'm going to do this because I love it. Or I'm going to do this because rather than the pattern I was in, which is more certificates, more freaking certificates, like maybe the next one will solve this endless search for completion. <laughs> Just right, right, right. It's this idea, you know, I, I always, I always have, I've trained in another model. I mean, I've been coaching for over 12 years now. So I have other training in my background. And one of the models that I'm trained in is a model that starts with the premise that nobody is broken. Yeah. No one, no one's broken. Not one person listening to this episode is broken. You are not broken. You are naturally creative, resourceful, mm. and whole. You have everything you need already. You've just gotten a little distracted or stuck. You, you've lost the clarity on that. Um, but as a coach, I see that as my primary role is to help people uh, get clarity on first that concept. I already have the answers. I already know what I need and what I, what I don't need. I know all of this. I know who I am. Um, help them get clarity on that and then help them get unstuck so they can start taking steps towards a life that's actually in alignment with what that is. But I think this idea that somehow we're broken or there's something missing and we, you know, or we've, you know, we're irreparably damaged. I don't think that serves us. I think we do far better when it comes to creating a resonant life. If we start from a place of like, actually, I've got this. It doesn't feel like I've got this. And I feel like I've lost my way a little bit, but I can remember back to a time when life felt really good. When I, you know, and this is where I go with my clients when it comes to this whole piece of like, what do I need more of? What do I need less of? Like think back to a time for many of my clients, it's a time before alcohol was running the show. Think back to that time. What made you happy? What brought you joy? What were the things in your life that you were proud of that you were doing? Are they still there? And usually the answer is no, you know, and this is for me, like writing is a perfect example of this before I was drinking, before I was felt like I needed to be doing everything that everybody else thought I was doing. I was sitting at the kitchen table in my parents' house, writing stories. Mm -hmm. That's what I was doing. And I forgot all about that because I got so caught up in all of the, you know, what I should be, the should haves and should be's and all of that stuff. So you are not broken. I don't care where you are in your life. And, you know, probably you, you might be in a situation where all kinds of awful things have happened to you, but you're still the person that you were before all of this. And as I also like to say, it's never too late to be who you always were. So you can, you can go back and become that person who felt whole and who felt fulfilled and resonant. It's possible for you. Um, mm. You know, and there are, there's so many things we could talk about, you know, about how to get there, but it's all the stuff you guys are already talking about on this podcast. And it's all the things I talk about on my podcast. It's not one little, you know, magical answer. Um, 
but there is so much hope around this topic. Yeah, it's not purchased, it's owned. And yeah. uh, you just got to remember, there's just a few clouds in the way. Exactly. <laughs> and when exactly. it clears, like you'll connect. Yeah. yeah. So Wendy, you mentioned your um, your podcast, like tell us about, you know, tell the, our listeners about what you do and what you're up to and, you know, all, sure. all that cool stuff. Yeah. So my podcast is called Bite Sized Balance and you can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts on Apple and Spotify and Google Podcasts and Stitcher and all those places. Um, and the podcast is really focused on started, uh, it started almost two years ago as a, a just a, honestly, for me, it was just a, oh, here's something that's really terrifying for you. Why don't you go try, try? <laughs> and I, I'd been resisting it for so long. I actually called my first, as, as Ellie knows, I called my first episode, I, on my first episode, I was calling it my fake podcast because I just basically been dared by a bunch of people to do, to do an episode. And so I did one episode and I thought, well, we'll see what happens with this. And I, it turned out, surprise, surprise, that when I actually stretched myself out into my comfort zone, doing the thing that I kind of knew deep down that I would probably love, that I did love it. And it was really great. And I, um, got great feedback from it. And so the podcast was really born in that, in that first fake podcast episode. And uh, now we have a weekly, we have weekly episodes. We focus on, um, my goal is to really focus on extraordinary, ordinary women. That's kind of my um, premise. So it, it's, you know, I interview some pretty fancy big celebrities too, but a lot of the episodes are just me talking to women who I think have extraordinary things to share with other women, um, but who are really living fairly ordinary lives. And uh, really the focus is uh, for midlife, women in midlife who are struggling with all of the things we've been talking about on this episode, overwhelm, the doing. Um, also, we talk a lot about alcohol, so it's not an alcohol centric podcast, but probably one out of every four episodes is very alcohol focused. And then it, it just comes up in the course of all of the other things that I talk about. Um, and uh, we also talk about midlife and hormones, perimenopause, menopause. Uh, and really, I aim to give really honest information um, and to have the conversations that are missing for for my generation of women. That's really what the podcast is about. And it's, uh, I am a huge, huge fan and it's been so helpful for me and I talk a little bit about my hormones. Poor Sam has to listen to me banging on about my hormones. But I've learned <laughs> so much just from tuning into you and to Sarah Bailey talking about all of the different subjects that you cover. Like it, it's been... I, I don't know, actually, I don't know where I would be now on my hormonal journey, my hormonal roller coaster, if I hadn't have started tuning in and got more informed then. Like it's the, the thing that I love is having these conversations um, that that like they need to be had and it, be, it just becomes it's like a groundswell. It's the same with alcohol, like it, things change and by God, do things need to change as far as women's wellness is concerned. So I absolutely love, dearly love what you're, what you're doing. And uh, it's wait like two years. Ah, I know I'm almost at two years. And I'll tell you one thing I did. I decided after the first year, cause it's a lot to put a podcast on every week. You guys know that now. Yep. Um, and I do, I just do it by myself. So, you know, mm. I'm just, uh, always been a sole practitioner and I love that. Um, but I do all, I do everything myself for it. I have someone who helps me with the social media side of it, but it's a lot. And after the first, you know, it's getting to the end of the first season. I was maybe in like June or July last year and it, it started in September. And so I was thinking, well, I'll just run like a full year as a season. And I, I thought to myself, what are you doing? Why do you feel like you need to put an episode out for these people every single week for the entire year? How about you take advantage of some of this quote unquote balance that you've created for yourself and actually tell people you're going to take a break for the summer. So that is what I do. And I will be the last episode will be airing at the end of June and I will be taking July and August off again this year. It's an opportunity to recharge for me, but also to, you know, find some new great guests for next year. Um, so Thank you, Ellie, for that, um, for that, for that feedback on the podcast. I love doing it. And I know that um, it really, you know, I wish that this podcast had been available for me um, when I was going through a lot of the stuff that I was going through. I think that's such a freaking powerful, that's, a, that's an example of a really playful, creative 
beautiful energy that fuels us like and i think that's that's amazing and hopefully in a small way we're doing that here as well and it's so lovely well it's so lovely to hear you talking about it properly wendy because um yeah i mean we haven't we haven't spoken as much as, as you and ellie have so it's really lovely to to hear a bit more about you and your world and uh, i really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing all that oh it's been my pleasure thank you so much for having me so before you go wendy we want to see your pajamas please <laughs> oh, <Throw> <laughs> All right, they're actually nice. If I don't, if I don't show you the waistband, they're quite colorful. Can you guys see them? Look at those. Yeah, they're cool. <laughs> I am wearing a shirt on top. I will say I did quickly throw that on, but Ellie and I recorded an episode of my podcast before this, and I screwed up my alarm, and then everything was kind of crazy. I'm looking forward to going inside and having a, a proper cup of coffee and uh, getting myself yeah. <laughs> self-regulating my nervous system because I haven't had time to do that yet today. <laughs> Is there, before you go and treat yourself to coffee, is there any other, anything else you want to signpost people to in terms of links or wet or any of that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sam. Well, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at, be net, uh, at beat burnout and booze on Instagram. And um, my website really has all the information about who I am and what I do and more information on the podcast, which is just wendymccallum.com. Awesome. And we'll put all your links and stuff in the show notes. So. Perfect. Thank Please you. Please go check them out. Cool. You're a darling. Thank you so much, Wendy. It's been oh, you're a so welcome. blast. Loved it. It has been fun. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of it. I guess it's the evening there for you guys. I'm now going to go about my day, which I figure if it started this way, it can only go uphill. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even need to take your pajamas off. It's fine. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. You too.